cross of Jesus Christ is a wondrous paradox. Because it is on the one hand a moment of tremendous triumph. The cross is where God gives us salvation. The cross is where God once and for all defeats the forces of sin and darkness. It is at the cross that the veil between God and humanity is torn and we are reconciled unto him through faith in Jesus Christ. The cross is a moment of hope for all humanity because it is by the cross of Jesus Christ that we are saved. For the past three weeks, as we've been looking at the last words of Jesus from the cross, we have seen that hope play out in some of the things that Jesus says with his dying breaths. Father, forgive them, he says, of those putting him to death. Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And from those words, we are reminded of the hope of forgiveness. That because of Jesus' death on the cross, we are forgiven of our sins. When Jesus turns to the criminal dying beside him and says to him those reassuring words, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. We're reminded of the hope of redemption. That none of us are too far gone for the salvation which God offers in him. That each of us can have eternal life with God if we will place our faith in the crucified Christ. Just last Sunday, we saw as Jesus brought together from the cross his mother Mary, his disciple John, And made them a new family. And were reminded of that hope, which is the church. A hope that in Christ, broken people can come together and become a spiritual family. The cross is a place of hope. But I told you that it's a paradox. That's because the cross may be a place of hope, but it is also a place of despair. Because the cross is where humanity put the Son of God to death. The cross is where human beings, having been confronted for more than 30 years with the character of God, the power of God, the incarnate word of God, walking and talking and eating and drinking and sleeping and living among them. Human beings said, we'll have none of that. And chose to execute him. The cross is the place where darkness falls upon the land, where the very earth convulses at what is taking place. It is the place where the word made flesh dies. And that despair is seen in the word that we read today from Mark's gospel the 15th chapter, the 34th verse, where Jesus says those four haunting Aramaic words, Eloi, Eloi, Lama, Sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you abandoned me? Why have you left me alone? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
There's few things that compare with the devastation of being forsaken. Think about the fear that you see on a child's face in the grocery store when they look around and realize that they don't know where their mommy or their daddy is. Think about the fear on their face, the panic that sets in when they think just for a moment that they are all alone, that they have been left behind. Think about the confusion and the anger that an employee feels when they find out that after years, even decades of service to their place of business, that they've been let go. That the place that they've called home for so long no longer has need of them, can no longer make use of them. Think about the tremendous grief that a spouse feels upon learning that their husband or their wife has been unfaithful to them. There's few things that compare with that pit in your stomach that comes with the knowledge, the belief that you have been abandoned, that you have been forsaken. And Jesus, from the cross, declares that God has forsaken him. That's almost unfathomable to us, that God would forsake Jesus. That God the Father would forsake his only son. It doesn't line up with the character of God as we understand it all throughout the Old Testament and into the New. After all, God had told his people Israel that I will never leave you nor forsake you. And as we read the Old Testament, we see the truth in that promise. We see that no matter how unfaithful Israel is to God, he never leaves them. He never abandons them. He remains with them, not only in the best of times, but in the worst. This idea that God would forsake Jesus doesn't line up with the character of God, and it, it, it doesn't line up with the evidence that we see in the life of Jesus. After all, Jesus' very birth came about through the presence of God. Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit of God. When Jesus began his ministry, when his ministry was inaugurated in the Jordan River as John the Baptist baptized him. Do you remember what happened? The Holy Spirit descended like a dove upon Jesus. And a voice from heaven declared, this is my son, the beloved. With him, I am well pleased. We follow Jesus' ministry. We see again and again the presence of God in his life and in his ministry. We see the power of God at work as Jesus performs miracle after miracle, bringing sight to the blind, bringing hearing to the deaf, bringing wellness to the diseased. We hear it in the voice of Jesus as he declares again and again to the crowds that you have heard it said by the teachers of the law, this, but I now tell you a better word. That Jesus has come not to abolish what came before, not to abolish the law or the prophets, but to fulfill them. And in the teachings of Jesus, we hear the power of God. We hear the word of God. Throughout Jesus' three years of ministry, it could not be more evident that this is a man of God. And that yes, this is the very son of God. The Messiah promised long ago by the prophets, sent to save. 
But what do we do with those words of Jesus? That quote that he's bringing out from the recesses of his ministry, that quote from Psalm 22, when his ancestor David had asked the same question, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That psalm ends in triumph, but it begins in despair. And while the same story will be true for Jesus, stay tuned till Easter Sunday. Make no mistake, in this moment, Jesus is in verse 1 of that psalm. He has not yet reached the end. He is forsaken. At the cross, Jesus is alone. could that be how could it be that jesus is alone we know that his people have left him we remember how in the garden when the religious officials accompanied by soldiers came to arrest jesus we remember that his disciples took off into the night that they fled in fear We remember that one of those 12, Judas Iscariot, was the one who had led these officials and these soldiers to Jesus, that Judas had betrayed his Lord. We remember how Peter, seemingly the most steadfast of them all, seemingly the one who would have gone to the ends of the earth for Jesus, we remember how in the temple courtyard, asked not once, not twice, but three times if he was an associate of the Lord's, how again and again and again he denied Jesus, said, I don't know the man. I have nothing to do with him. We remember how the crowds that had come to hear Jesus and come to receive his miraculous power, we remember how They're nowhere to be found at the cross. How some have even turned against him, shouting, crucify him, crucify him. We look to the scene of the cross, and the only ones who seem to have remained faithful are John, who makes his way back after first having run, and those few brave women from Galilee who come to see their Lord we, we know that Jesus is forsaken by people, but forsaken by God? How does, that even, how does that even work in terms of metaphysics, in terms of the Trinity? How, how does God abandon God the Son who's filled with God the Spirit? How does that even work? You could rack your brains for weeks, months, years on end. And you would still likely arrive to the same conclusion that I have and that men and women far smarter than me have, which is chalk it up to mystery. Chalk it up to the divine workings of God and simply understand that there are things which are beyond our pay grade. Things which we, with our limited human capacity, can't possibly understand. The question this morning is not how is Jesus forsaken on the cross. The question is why. Why is Jesus left to die alone? Why is there no dove from heaven this time? Why do the angels not come to minister to him as they had when Jesus was tempted in the desert? Why are Moses and Elijah nowhere to be found as they had been on the Mount of Transfiguration? Why is Jesus left all alone? The simple answer is sin. Sin, which we so often define simply as the bad things you do, That's the way we explain it to our children from an early age. Sin is when you do bad things. Sin is when you're disobedient. And that's 
That's true, but it's bigger even than that. Those things which are outside the will of God. Sin is all of those things which are opposite of his pure and perfect will. And ever since Genesis chapter 3, we have been held captive by sin. Ever since Adam and Eve brought sin into the world way back in the garden, we have seen the devastation that sin has wrought upon our world and upon our lives. And God can have nothing to do with sin. And so there existed this separation between the world God created and especially his favorite creation, us, created in his image. A separation between humanity and the God who gave us life. God can have nothing to do with sin. And so for us to have fellowship with God, a solution needed to be found. There had to be some way for reconciliation. And the prophet Isaiah gave us a clue as to what it would be. In Isaiah 54, verse 5, when speaking of a suffering servant to come, the prophet said that he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. The apostle would put it differently in 1 Peter 2.24, when it says of Christ that he himself bore our sins in his body, On the cross. So that free from sins we might live for righteousness. Or quoting the prophet, by his wounds we are healed. Paul put it this way. He who knew no sin became sin. That we might become the righteousness of God. In Galatians, he says that Jesus became a curse for us. Jesus took on the sins of humanity and bore them on the cross so that we could be saved. And as Jesus hung from that cross, he was experiencing not only the physical agony of crucifixion not only the emotional agony of being betrayed and abandoned but the spiritual agony of taking on all the sins of the world upon his sinless self and in doing so dying on the cross Separated from his father. Forsaken by him. The proof is in the answer to what Jesus said. He cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the devastating response of heaven was silence. Why? Was Jesus forsaken upon the cross? The one answer is sin, and specifically our sin. But I want to offer you another answer as well. The love of God. The reason Jesus was forsaken on the cross was because God loved this world loves this world so much that he paid it all so that we could be with him. That just as I told the kids earlier, he sought us out. He came running after us 
and he gave everything he had to give so that we could have salvation. So that instead of being forever separated from God, instead of being condemned under the law, instead we could be reunited with our Heavenly Father under grace. Jesus was forsaken so that we wouldn't have to be. Jesus was left alone so that we could be with God. Jesus died alone so that we could be part of the family of God. You'll often hear a, a phrase tossed about in the hard places of this world. That these are God-forsaken places. When you go to a place that's been devastated by natural disasters, by fire or flood, by tornado or hurricane walk through the rubble and say, what a God-forsaken hole this has become. Go to a place like Kiev, Mariupol, and those places appear to be very God-forsaken indeed. We see destruction. We see all of the power of sin and darkness at work in these God-forsaken places. And so there is a temptation to look at the cross and to listen to the words of Jesus here and to say that surely the cross is the most God-forsaken place of all. That when you look to the cross, you see a place where sin and darkness and death won the final victory. That this is the place where all of the forces of evil converged and emerged victorious. Surely the cross is the most God-forsaken place of all. But I want you to know this today. For Jesus and for him alone... The cross is a God-forsaken place. But for you and I, the cross is exactly where God is found. For you and I, the cross is where we look when we want to know the heart of God. Because the cross is where we see the amazing love of God. The cross is where we see all that God was willing to give for us. The cross is where we see God as a suffering servant, willing to pay it all for you and me. So what I invite you to do this morning, as we think about the cross, as we reflect upon the cross, as we sing about the the cross balance the hope with the despair for it's both at the same time but for you and for me when we look to the cross may we not see it as a god forsaken place may we see it as where the love of god is found